6.35, you may remember last year we brought you the story of Ian Patterson, the jailed breast surgeon who subjected more than a thousand patients to unnecessary and damaging operations over 14 years. Well, today it has been extraordinarily revealed that a further 1,000 500 more patients of Patterson have been contacted after a computer glitch meant they were missed off the earlier recalls. Debbie Douglas is a victim of the disgraced surgeon and she still campaigns about this. Debbie, thank you so much for joining me this, this evening. It's an almost unbelievable story. Just talk us through your experiences of Patterson. What happened? Um, I saw Patterson in 2003. Um, I was a mother of three children uh, aged 45 and... Um, presented with a very small lump. He overoperated on me, basically. Uh, the lump that um, should have just been removed using a lumpectomy uh, top operation was turned into a massive operation whereby he used part of my stomach muscle to reroute it under my chest wall to reconstruct the breast. He removed the whole breast, um, well, actually left breast tissue, removed all my lymph nodes, and I had unnecessary chemotherapy. And all this completely unnecessary for some kind of strange purpose of his own or kink of his own? Well, I had um, a very high grade one cancer, which is a very low grade cancer. So a small operation would have sufficed and maybe radiotherapy, but I found out much later I didn't need the operation he gave me. And also I didn't need chemotherapy, which I was subjected to for six months. Well, I'm so horrible. What a horrible thing to happen to anybody. And now you learn that another 1,500 people have been contacted because of a computer glitch. How did you find out about this? I was actually uh, sent a, an invitation for a, a Zoom call, which was yesterday, to talk to um, Head of Communications for Spire and to um, the recall manager. And uh, on that call, they started off by telling me, I thought they would actually tell me that the first tranche of... Uh, uh, operations had been completed sorry the recalls had been completed however when i um got on the call they started by saying that's happened however they found out that uh, 1500 patients that were on um a legacy type computer that had gone out of circulation uh, they changed systems um admitted to flag up that the, there were another 1500 patients that were completely missed and they were an uh, operated yeah. on by Patterson between 1999 and um, early 2000s. Sorry, 1993 and, and early 2000s. And they will presumably be getting the awful news right now that they were in, caught up in this. What do you think about, about Spire Healthcare, which is a private healthcare company, and the way it's handled this? I just think it's one appalling event after another. I mean, you know, you spoke in the introduction about a thousand patients being recalled. Um, but there were more than a thousand patients that were affected. Spire over lockdown and over the last couple of years have written to 11,000 patients. This is, and so with the NHS, they've written to 11,000 patients in total. Spire's uh, figures are broken down by six and a half thousand patients first identified. A thousand um, have already died. And, and now there's a further 1,500. So it's just shocking that we keep getting this drip feed of information because they haven't done the recall properly and in a robust manner. This happened between the patients, between Patterson and a private healthcare company. Do you think the government have a role in sorting the mess out now? Absolutely. The inquiry was published three years ago this Saturday and the recommendations of that inquiry were that um, to put that patient safety at the foremost and to implement those recommendations. Three years on, they're still not implemented. So the consultant still rents the room at Spire. They generally don't, they're not employed by the um, operator. Uh, basically, if there's any indemnity or any issues, um, that could be negated by the fact that it was a criminal act, so compensation won't be paid. Um, we're asking, you know, one of the recommendations was for a database of surgeons. Um, with all of the sort of right metrics there so that the, the public can have an informed choice on which surgeon to, to basically mm. go with. That doesn't exist. So 15 of the recommendations, they just haven't, that, haven't happened. So the government needs to take responsibility for that. 
there's a lot of campaigning still to, to, to go on. Debbie, I'm so sorry for what happened to you and very grateful to you for talking to me tonight. Thank you so much. Dr. Kathy Kale, Spires Group Medical Director, apologized for, she said, significant distress and harm suffered by patients. Over the past couple of years, we have been absolutely committed to identifying, tracking down and contacting all living patients of Ian Patterson, regardless of where they were treated, she said. We accepted the recommendations of the independent inquiry into Patterson in 2020 and are fully committed to implementing them. So does there still need to be more regulation in private health care? David Rolls is director of the Centre for Health and Public Interest. David, thank you for joining me this evening. Um, the first question is the obvious one. This all happened in a, in a private company. Do we need tighter regulation by the state of private health care in situations like this? Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, absolutely. I think one of the, the major learning points from looking at the Patterson case, um, and we've looked at this over the past um, five or six years, is to realise that this isn't the first time that this has happened. So if you take a step back all the way to the 1990s, you may remember there was a notorious so-called butcher surgeon called Rodney Ledwood, um, who carried out many of the same types of of horrendous unnecessary procedures on mainly women, um, often in the private hospital sector. There was a set of recommendations published in 1999, which recommended much tighter regulation of private hospitals, and in addition to ensure that the governance of private hospitals was brought up to scratch. Mm. Those recommendations weren't implemented. They haven't been implemented since the Rodney Ledwood inquiry, nor have the recommendations of the um, inquiry into Ian Patterson being introduced. What we see within the private hospital sector are some systemic patient safety risks that are known about both by regulators, by the Department of Health, by the medical profession, and yet to date nothing has happened in order to address those. And if this kind of hideous thing has happened twice before, it can happen again. It might even be happening now. And you're saying there has nothing really, nothing has really changed to stop that. Well, again, your point is very, very relevant because when you look back at the Rodney Ledwood case in 2000, when there was a health select committee inquiry into what happened in that particular instance, one of the leading medics at the time said, there is another Rodney Ledwood waiting in the wings. That was in 2000. Now we're hearing and we now. Know his, and now we know his name. I mean, it's extraordinary. So in specific terms, for people listening who haven't been following this case very closely, what do you think the government should now be doing to, to, to ensure this can't happen again? Well, I think there really needs to be a serious look at the private hospital business model because it's that which leads to some of the patient safety risks that are being uh, manifest in this particular case. As Debbie has pointed out, um, the liability arrangements in private hospitals means that the hospital don't take responsibility for what the consultant does. There's also a financial incentive structure in the private hospital sector, which means that the more work that a surgeon does, the more money that they make. And you raise the question of why Ian Patterson actually undertook some of his operations. Spire has actually argued in court that he did so for financial reasons. So if you think most doctors have absolutely no interest in being motivated by money. But if you have doctors who are motivated by money in private hospitals, who want to carry out unnecessary treatment in order mm. to generate more income, then what you need is a very strict set of regulations to prohibit that type of financial incentive from leading to harm in the way that it has done in this case. Um, and the All third that. thing... Sorry. Sorry. Go on. No, the, the, the third aspect, and, and this is very relevant because the Labour Party and the Conservative Party are both keen to push more NHS patients into the private hospital sector. That's exactly what, what I was going to ask you about. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 you read my mind. And at the, at the very same time that this is going on and these hospitals are not properly regulated, you make it sound almost as if the hospitals are just a kind of hotel venue for private surgeons to come in and use when it's convenient for them. They're not, as it were, organically connected to the healthcare that's taking place on their premises. And if that's the case, it was, it's surely irresponsible for politicians of any party to be pushing more people into those hospitals. I think there's a very um, strange 
failure amongst politicians to recognise and understand what private hospitals are. I'll give you an example about post-operative care in a private hospital. In an NHS hospital, you have all the facilities there in case something goes wrong. You have multidisciplinary teams, you have consultants, you have anaesthetists on site. In a private hospital, after the operation has actually occurred, the consultant and the anaesthetist will often leave and you're left in the care of a junior doctor, a resident medical officer, who is often working 168 hour shifts alone. And if something goes wrong, there are no intensive care facilities to be able to look after you. And for example, even in the middle of the pandemic, we know that over 6,000 patients were transferred from private hospitals to the NHS because something had gone wrong and the private mm. hospital couldn't cope. Now, it's that type of issue which we really do think that politicians from across both uh, parties need to grapple with if they're going to continue to push more NHS patients down that route. David Rowlands, I think a lot of people will be listening to that and thinking, there's a huge amount for me to think about there. I may have to change my behaviour as a result of what I've heard. Thank you so much for talking to me. Now, coming up,